Hello, everyone. These family times for which we've come together have often been at the passing of people we loved and who loved us. I think we're generally a loving family. Because we are, we tend to love the people that the people we love, love. Friends, family, husbands, wives, moms, and dads. Very soon we start thinking of each other, not as legal members of the family, such as mother-in-law or father-in-law or sister-in-law or brother-in-law, but just brothers and sisters, uncles, aunts, moms, dads. It's a beautiful network of love. It happens because in the mainstream, we were first loved by someone else. We learned what it meant to be accepted and loved and passed it on to the next person. This is how I think of James. He was someone I loved and someone who loved me. He was someone who loved? Sure, he may never have framed it that way. I mean, he was not someone who gushed out statements of I love you too broadly. But if you were listening, you could pick up on his disposition of love. In my thinking, someone who makes you feel loved is just as important as the person who is constantly saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. For James, especially, when he said, I love you, you took him seriously and you took note of it. And as one man to another, when James hugged you, or more likely hugged you back, it was a unique and memorable experience. The evidence of James being a loving person showed in his discussions about his life. I remember some long drives with James, mostly going to auctions. On one of these drives, James took me on a tour of his life. It was a long tour. It started with how he played sports as a boy. He was a good athlete. When I asked him if he had brothers and sisters, however, the story became even more interesting. He told me about being one of nine children, poor, with no father present in the home. His mother was a gospel preacher, but forced to give him up to a boy's home because he and a brother were too much of a burden on her frail financial budget. I thought, his mother gave him up for adoption? As James went on, he described her as someone who had done it because she had to do it, and that it was her best move, and that he loved her then, and he loved her now. Is that the disposition of love? I thought it was. In my view of parenting, I believe that it's important to share the gospel with your children. Earlier, I said that we're loved because someone loved us. I think James' mother was the first one to love him and to share with him that God also loved him. As a gospel preacher myself, I think a gospel preacher, like his mother, would tell him about Jesus dying on a cross. I think this is why it's not been surprising from time to time to hear James make a declaration of his belief system. On one such occasion, again in a car going to a tr on a trip with James, I was telling him about the prison ministry, which I've served in for about 17 years now. He was interested. As I talked to him, I shared how incredible it is to work with men jailed for serious crimes. They all have very dark backgrounds, but many were brought up in Christian families. It's common to be told by these previously violent men, I don't deserve, deserve to be loved by God, and God won't forgive me for the things that I've done. I found over time that trying to tell them that God does indeed love them is not an effective pathway for them to embrace the love of God. As a result, I don't try to convince them that God loves them. I ask them two simple questions. Do you believe that Jesus is God, that he is Lord? And do you believe that Jesus died to forgive your sins and that he rose from the dead? Yes, I do, is the only response I've ever heard to those questions. 
I then quote Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead, you are saved. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the message of Christ. We do not say these things to calculate all that we must do for Christ. We don't hear these things to be something about how I deserve or don't deserve to be saved by Christ or wondering how good I am. But by looking into your heart and asking, do I believe that Jesus is Lord? This is a deep question. Do I believe that Jesus rose from the dead? These beliefs are revealed to us according to scriptures by the Holy Spirit through regeneration. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It is by grace you have been saved, by faith. And this is not of yourself. It is the gift of God. So just in case you think I'm off on a preaching jag, uh, I want you to remember that I was telling you a story about prison ministry in a conversation I had with James. When I finished, we sat there very quietly and drove along in the car. I turned to James after a while and I said, do you believe that Jesus is Lord? Do you believe that he rose from the dead? Without turning his head toward me, guess what he instantly said? Yes, I do. That day it was confirmed to me that James Spears was my brother in Christ. Can you endure one more story? Doesn't matter. I love Buicks. I've owned five of them in my lifetime. Three with the help of James. The last one I purchased through James is an interesting tale. Karen and I drove down from Maryland to Bowling Green to go to an auction with James. We're going to run the old Buick I had through the auction, and then we're going to bid on a new Buick. It's a great plan. So we got to Bowling Green, and the schedule had been changed, and we couldn't go to Bowling Green to the auction that week. And so I was feeling a bit down, but James said, don't, don't worry, we can go to an auction in Nashville. And so later in the week, we went down to Nashville for this other auction. Auction. I was optimistic. And I remember on the way down, in the car, as we were talking, and I just and then we were silent, we'd talk and be quiet and talk and be quiet. And I just kind of prayed a prayer, just suddenly just prayed a prayer. And I said, Lord, I pray that we will find a fully loaded Buick Lucerne at this auction today and get it for $8,000. That was it. No prayer meeting broke out. It's just a simple prayer. Well, there were exactly zero Buick Lucernes in Nashville. Though James did try to get me to buy a genuinely nice Ford, but with no success. So after the auction, back we went to Bowling Green. It was a long trip with no new car. As we were coming up on the Bowling Green exit, next to the auction, James said, maybe we could go in and check if there's any cars that have been dropped off for next week's auction. So in we went. We turned right into the auction, drove past all those big, huge doors. Um, then we went, turned left at the corner, drove around to the back of the building, to the back lot. Right there in the middle of the upper lot, all by itself, was a light gold 2008 Buick Lucerne. We went right inside and we talked to the owner who happened to be there. He was working late that day, he happened to be there. And James asked about the Lucerne. We were told that it was already a car that had been run through the auction and that the owners had pulled it out without selling it because they needed to get more than $8,500 for it. And so I sat there and James sat there and we kept looking at the guy and he just, he kind of looked at us and he, he told us that story. And then he said, 
However, I'll call them again and ask them if they'll take your $8,000 bid. Long story short, James and I were standing outside waiting for this call to be over, and the guy walked out, and he said, they accepted your bid. The car is yours. <laughs> so as we were driving out of the gate, James turned to me and said, well, looks like God answered that prayer, John. <laughs> uh, the last time I clearly talked with James was on the telephone, and we talked about several different things. It was a nice conversation. And as we closed, I said, I love you, James. Without hesitation, he said, I love you too. I don't believe love happens spontaneously. I believe it's a gift of God. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who love, loves has been born of God and knows God. That is my testimony about James Spears and his love for God and his love for people. How do you explain? How do you describe a love that goes from east to west and runs as deep as it is wide? Lord, you know all our hopes. Lord, you know all our fears. And words cannot express the love we feel, but we long for you to hear. So listen to our hearts, hear the Spirit sing, a song of praise that flows from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are, but words are not enough. Tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. If words could fall like rain from these lips of mine, and if I had a thousand years, Lord, I would still run out of time. If you listen to my heart. Every beat would say, Thank you for the life, thank you for the truth, thank you for the way. Yeah. So listen to our hearts, hear the Spirit sing a song of praise that flows from those you have redeemed. Listen to our hearts, so listen to our hearts, hear our spirits sing, a song of praise that flows from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are, but words are not. to our heart. Words are not enough to tell you of our love, so listen to our heart. Words are not enough to tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. Oh, yes, Lord. 
Listen to our hearts. And there proclaim 
my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee.
I am free. You took my sins and died upon the tree. Today in celebrating communion, I thought we might reflect briefly upon the power of God. I can remember early on in my Christian life, I always thought of the power of God being related to miraculous things that would take place and had a desire to see uh, such workings of the Lord. It's interesting that in the Gospel of John, uh, he refers to the miracles of the Lord as signs. On the other hand, the scriptures look at the power of God connected directly with our salvation so that the Apostle Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto the salvation of all who believe. Uh, elsewhere in Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians, he said, the, the gospel is folly to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God unto those who are saved, and it is the word of the cross. The gospel is the word of the cross, the power of God. When we think of the message of the gospel, it is the power of God. It is the effectual working of the omnipotence power of God in the hearts of those who believe. When George Whitfield went from place to place to proclaim the gospel, it was the gospel to which he was committed because he knew the gospel was the power of God to transform and change lives. The Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, I have known nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified because the proclamation of the gospel, the word of the cross, was the power of God to transform and change lives lives. And so today we celebrate communion because the power of God has been manifest within us. He has transformed us. He has changed us. He has caused us to be born again by his power. He has caused that which is dead to come to life. And so we are manifestations of the power of God because the gospel has been worked within our lives and within our hearts the word of the cross. We celebrate the cross today, the power of God that has effectually worked his salvation in our lives. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful today for salvation that we have in Christ. We know that this is not something that is a result of our own decision, our own effort, our own merit, our own working. But we are saved because of the gospel. We are saved because of your omnipotent power working in our lives and in our hearts, causing us to be born again. We have become partakers of your divine nature because of this effectual working. And in this, we celebrate the cross today. And we are so grateful for the work of Christ upon the cross, that he has made us acceptable before you because we are in him, his righteousness imputed to us, forgiveness extended to us through the shedding of his blood upon the cross. We thank you, Father, today for this rich and powerful salvation that we celebrate today. The Word of God tells us that on the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, 
he took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Let us take together. And after supper, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us take together. For the scriptures go on to say that for as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. God bless you. Mark 3, verses 7 through 12 today. Can we stand one more time and honor God's word, read together? There are Bibles on the table in the back if you'd like to borrow one today, if you don't have a Bible with you. Okay. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed When they heard all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Edomia, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because the crowd, because the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready. Excuse me. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the spirits, evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell who he was. Father, awaken us by your word today. I thank you, Father, that you have invested yourself in your word. And we thank you for that. We thank you that by your word we we hear your voice. By your word we know if we're hearing your voice. And by your word, Lord, you teach us as your spirit breathes upon it and out from it, inspiring us afresh. I pray, Lord, today we will be inspired by your word. We'll also be illuminated by it in our lives. And that you'll receive glory and honor today. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Praise God. Be seated. It is a, a very interesting phenomenon to look through the scriptures and, um, and read them. It is uh, something else also to look at them carefully. And as you look at them carefully, to see things that don't initially strike you as anything more than just a transition from one thing to the next. And this, this verse of scripture, these verses of scripture can be viewed that way. As a result, there's a temptation to want to to take the next seven verses also where Jesus is appointing his apostles. And, um, but whenever I do that, I always find myself, even if, I, even if I stand here as I'm talking about these scriptures, I always find myself feeling that there's, it's, it's just kind of breathes a little bit more, you know what I mean? There's more that comes out besides the idea of just being some transitional sentence. As a result, I don't really think there are any transitional sentences in the scriptures. I think every piece of information we find in the scriptures has tremendous value for it. And in in the study of this particular sermon and preparing for the sermon, I found the same thing to be true. As I started out, I kept saying, boy, you know, this is, I better go with the next seven verses because I might just find myself in five minutes finished with this. Unfortunately, I never found myself five minutes at any time ever with it finished after five minutes. And I don't think this is going to be an exception this morning. Because there is, there is some, something very valuable, I think, here for us to see. And we have to ask ourselves the question, what message can we discover in this text beyond just the sense of the overwhelming size and demand of the need 
that were surrounding Jesus. I want to spend a little time trying to elaborate on that. We, we see the word crowds. We see the word large crowds. And we think in terms of, well, so he, so he had a lot of people following him. But we want to go on and find something else. Instead of recognizing that dynamic is a, is a really incredible dynamic. I remember years ago when this church had a, a larger population and it was a different day, but it's a, I was an associate pastor here and I had an office right back where I have an office right now. And between the two services that we had, I would just want to go back and just sit at my desk, just sit at my desk, close the door and be alone for about, it was a half hour between these services for just maybe 20 minutes and just sit there with nothing going on. And I wasn't preaching the sermon, I was just an associate. I was one of the associates here, assistants, actually. And from the time I left this front row where I was sitting and walked back through those doors and walked over to the office doors and down that hallway and then down to the office, how long do you think it would take if we all did that together right now? All of us, just why not my office? Two and a half minutes maybe if we were lagging around. Got to go to the bathroom, three minutes. I used to find myself, someone would say, hey, John, could you give me just a second? Yeah, sure. And then he'd tell me something. And then as they're talking, I see this person appear right here like this. And I was tempted not to look at the person because I knew as soon as they did, they were going to go, oh, John. And I'd go, which one now should I be talking to? And the, the dynamic for me was, that I was determined I was going to give attention to every single person I talked to. I wasn't going to be rude, but even then I'd, I'd listen to this person here for maybe a few, you know, it would have gone on for 35 minutes. But I, and I said, excuse me, maybe we could talk about this just a little bit later. Oh, sure. Now, what was it you wanted? Then all of a sudden, here's this thing right here, this, this person right here. Can you kind of picture it? And as they're talking, and then when they really do it, they get like this. And I'm going, I'm looking back and forth at him and trying to decide which one I'm supposed to look at. And I haven't left the building yet. I haven't left this room. It would literally take me 30 minutes to go back there through the foyer and back there. And his, what happened is I had people that were very offended that I was so rude to them. But people say, You're, you were so rude to me once, and that's why I don't like you. I say, when? Well, you're just walking to the church, and you just, you just sloughed me off. <laughs> wow. Imagine if everybody in the room decided they want to talk to you right now. Just, just us, right? We're not a big throng of people, but just us. If we all decided we want to talk to you, and we have something different to talk to you about, there's a dynamic there, isn't there? And it's a dynamic that basically you can spend all that time, and you don't tell anybody anything, and you don't learn anything from anybody. All you do is you're just manipulating yourself through an environment of voices and needs and desires, and stories to tell, and information to understand. I don't think we can even understand the magnitude of this. Of what Jesus, it says that Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake. Again, we see this idea of Jesus withdrawing. Just want to have a little quiet time, right? Time to kind of sit there and have his cup of tea or whatever. I don't know. I don't know what he drank in the morning. Drank something, you know. It's time to be away, maybe think about things, meditate a bit. However, <laughs> and is there. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed him. So a large crowd was following him. When he heard about all, when they heard about all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, from Jerusalem, from Edomia, and the regions across the Jordan and around the Tyre and Sidon, literally from the whole scope of the nation of Israel to its northernest borders, to its most southern borders, and everything in between, people were hearing about this person, not really sure what they're really hearing. Perhaps some people say he's a healer. Some people is a great teacher. Some people say he's the Messiah. Some people say he has the power of demons. And they're all going for the purpose of doing what? 
just being near him, being near him. As a result, he has this throng of people, almost from the inception of his ministry, that are crowding around him. We don't know how large these crowds were. There's a little indication in, later in Mark chapter 6, verse 44. Jesus invited a few people to lunch. Remember that? Remember that one? The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. 5,000. It's one-tenth the size of, Rock, size of Rockville. That's just the men. Okay, that's just the men. Now, if you figure they're married, some of them are married, let's say that, let's, I don't want to do too many statistics here because I get confused real quick. But anyway, let's just say triple that. If you've got kids and women at, there's 15,000 people. And this is, of course, the story of the feeding of the 5,000 men. But I'm sure that the wives and children also got fed too. So you got 15,000 people all pressing him. And this, it, lunch wasn't even the subject that was going on. He was teaching them and he was touching them and healing them and casting out impure spirits, it says. But 15,000 of them all wanting something from him. As a result, we see this dynamic that surrounds him from these people coming from everywhere. Galilee was not necessarily that easy a place to get to. It was a region that was very hilly and some places mountainous. The pathways were not secure. It wasn't like they were, there were highwaymen on the place. It was, a, it was a dangerous place to travel many times. And as a result, these people were taking risks of their lives. These two categories of people, the large crowds of Galilee, these are the ones that we see in the immediate region around Capernaum where Jesus was doing the different expressions of his ministry when the synagogue in Capernaum. Then you see the Peter's house in Capernaum. Then he returns to Capernaum. And you see him at Peter's house in Capernaum. These four things we've looked at, these four pictures. In each of these pictures, the large crowds were so intense just around the region of Galilee, people that could basically go hear him and then go home at night, they thronged them. To the point where roofs of houses are being torn off. Remember this? Tearing houses, the roofs of houses off. They're pressing themselves right into the courtyards of people's houses and filling their house up. Can you imagine that? We haven't, we're having an open house. That's basically what they're saying. Well, the open house was people coming in and staying in and demanding things the whole time they were there, all the way up until the nighttime. Do you get a picture in your mind at all? about the crowds just around Capernaum, just the ones from Galilee. And then if you add to that this other, by the way, this word crowd is a word that has a range of meaning, which means, and it's translated that, I believe, in the King James Version, multitude. A multitude is typically a group of people that is so large no one could count it for one reason or other. Now, in, this, in the sermons of George Whitfield, in his in the um, the, the biograph, biographical um, study of Whitfield, when he went to Boston and he stood in the Boston Commons to preach, this is only one example of it. Benjamin Franklin decided he was going to have a mathematical equation on how you'd number the people that were standing there, and so Benjamin Franklin walked in a square. Maybe it was you know twenty feet by twenty feet, and in that square he counted everybody in his twenty foot square. And then he said, I, I'm just going to calculate now around how many 20-foot squares like that can you get all the way around Boston Common? You ever been to Boston Common? It's a huge place. It's a place where you can't look from one side to the other. It's so, it's so big. But, and it didn't have the fences and the guards and the, you know, the signs and all that stuff. It was just basically an open place then. And he saw people all the way from the mansion the mansion that's there in Boston Commons, all the way down to Park Street Church and all the way back down to the other direction. He saw these squares of people and he calculated there were at least 75,000 people there. Well, I guess that makes it not a multitude, right? You ever been among 75,000 people? Have you? Been in the marches downtown during different times of the year when we go down we are different in our lives, be in the marches? You see these throngs of people. You look around, you just, you just see the sea of people everywhere. Well, that's a multitude. That was the kind of thing that was happening here. 
to the point where sometimes they didn't even know where Jesus was in the middle of all this because he was being, there were so many people coming and they weren't people that were coming in with a ticket to get into the concert. Everybody wanted to sit on the front row. Everybody wanted to have backstage time with Jesus. They wanted some personal experience and he was ministering to as many of these people as he could told us when he was in Capernaum that he healed everybody that came to him in Capernaum. Now that was beyond this, the scope, just as far as time is concerned. It doesn't say any longer that he healed every single person that came to him. If he was, he'd be there for weeks doing this. And guess what? The people in Capernaum, they had some place to go and sleep at night, right? They came from their homes. They well, it, was, it was a walking distance from the place in Galilee where they were to Capernaum, and they left afterwards. They could come after sunset on, on Sabbath so they could spend all night trying to get healed in the street in front of Peter's house. Remember that one? What about these other people? Where'd they come from? It's not just a 10-minute walk from Jerusalem to Capernaum and from these southern regions or the, south, the northern regions of Tyre and Sidon. It's not just a few minutes. It's not a few miles. It's, it's a... Sometimes a day's journey to get there. And when you get there, you think, you say, well, we saw Jesus. We've got to rush back home. Sorry we can't stay. We've got to rush back home. Now they start looking for some place to stay. And instantly overwhelm the whole, you know, guest idea of the whole area of Capernaum that he's in. And then they find themselves sleeping in the fields. They slept next to the lake. They stayed in some, they begged someone to sleep under their tree or whatever it was. And the food issue was just immensely overwhelmed almost immediately. This wasn't happening just once. This is not the, you look back and say, well, remember at Woodstock, man? Remember Woodstock, man? How was it Woodstock? You hear all this stuff, you just hear it in the 60s. Remember Woodstock, man? So many people there. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you're tearing things down, burning stuff up. You know, it was a really great concert. Let's burn down the stage. Okay, great. It was a really great time. I mean, I'm glad I was busy in the 60s. <laughs> instead of looking for something to do. But the same kind of mob mentality of wanting something and wanting someone specifically in this case. And in the midst of this throng, we see some things that are very instructive for us. In verse 7 it says, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake. Capernaum was a fishing town, and so it's on the lake. It's near the lake. You can see that. You have a map behind you? You, you see that Capernaum. It's right there in the, the, um, the northwestern corner of the Sea of Galilee. And you see up there that there's, there's Capernaum. So it's really already on the water. So it was a fishing village or a fishing, it was a city, more of a fishing city. But then as you want to go south or north, you have extended seashore where people would go and Sure, there was some place that early in the morning that he says, uh, he says uh, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to go to the lake. This is, this is very similar to what we see earlier in chapter 1, verse 35, where Jesus says he rose early, very early in the morning to take solitude for prayer. Chapter 2, verse 13, he uses the phrase once again. And we see this discipline of Jesus to be alone to gather his own thoughts, to meditate, to pray, to reflect upon what had taken place before, and then think in terms of what's going to happen next. Well, you don't have a, do you have a multitude around you? Sometimes it feels like that, doesn't it? Just by the things that we have to do next. There, you know, I have so many people I talk to, and I say, how are you doing? Oh, I'm just really tired. I'm really busy. I'm really busy. I'm really busy. What are you busy about? And you think, what are you busy about? You know, you're kind of overreacting. And they say, well, I got to do this, 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 and this, and this, and this. And after I get that, I do that. And once this is finished, I do the other thing. You think, you must be married, right? You think you're married. <laughs> you know, we have, we have our marriages, we have these lists we have to make sure we get. And we're, we're constantly doing that. But, up, but outside that, I mean, we're just, we live in a very hectic situation to the point we're already, we're, we're used to it, aren't we? That's how we live. What are you doing the rest of the day? Why don't we just hang out here for a while? What do you think? I know there's not a church coming in, but let's, let's go over to the library and maybe just kind of hang out for a while, right? They'll order pizza and hang out. Can anybody do it? 
Some people can do it. Who can't do it? Who's got something planned already? Come on, this is the interactive time, right? You just all you got to do is say, I do. <laughs> we always do. We're constantly planning for the next thing, next thing. I can't live with that calendar I have. You know why? Because people wake me up and say, where are you? <laughs> I forgot about them. Oh, no, I better not do that anymore. Jesus was in the, you take that and multiply it by a multitude, you get a little small reflection in your mind of what it was like here for Jesus. Mark pictures Jesus rising early in the morning and now walking beside the Sea of Galilee. Before he did it alone and now he's doing it with his disciples. But if you remember before, even when he did it early in the morning, he's walking by himself, the smaller groups of people would start walking with him. He started teaching them as he went along. The disciples would find him and say, what are you doing here? We gotta, let's go. we got to go, man. We've got to get this something done. So we see this context that Mark builds for us in verses 7 and 8. And he then shows us two things by this. There's some observations I think we can see because of what happens next. He says in verse 9, Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing toward him to touch him. Remember when we were in seminary, there was a, there was a concert that, I, I don't remember who the group was, but some kind of famous rock band was doing one of their final tours or something like that, and they had a, they had a, um, a ticket sale, that went, tickets went on sale long before this, and then the, the band itself insisted that certain people or get in without paying this, you know, $300 per ticket stuff. And so they made something like 500 tickets available for these people to get. And so they said they were going to go on sale at 6.30 or something like that in the morning. They didn't say, the line, they didn't make a line, say line forms here, anything like that. They just simply said, these tickets are going to be available free of cost, first come, first serve. And it was reported that, that several people had had, had nearly died. One person had been crushed to death, all because they started in the back, and when the doors were about to open, they just started pushing. They started pushing toward the front. Well, the people in the front, next, next thing you know, they're pinned up against the door. They're screaming for people to back up. People are screaming to back up, and people, it, it's just, by the time that they realized what they had done, these, one person had died, and several people were almost died, had almost died. Just because they're pushing. That certainly comes to my mind here. Pushing to get to the front. Pushing forward to touch him. Just as when Capernaum, when the numbers of people began to swell in response to the ministry of Jesus' teaching, people wanted to be near him. They wanted to be the one who was touched by Jesus. As I said before, tearing off roofs, pressing to enter people's homes where Jesus stayed, and filling the synagogue to overcapacity. This was the regular, normal context of the ministry that Jesus was finding opening up to him. So let's look at some observations. Number one, Jesus and his disciples, besides just the dynamic of crowds and what crowd behavior does, Jesus and these new disciples, and the next, chat, the next section that we start in verse um, 13 is going to talk about Jesus calling the disciples and then naming who the 12 disciples were. You see that in the next section there. Here, he's simply talking, he says, his disciples. Well, I know this is not chronological. So this, this verse isn't chronological to the others. This is an example that Mark is giving to show us the context of how Jesus and his disciples were ministering to people. And what is, the, what, what is the observation? Well, they're being watched. What time shall we get up tomorrow morning and go down to the sea, go down to the shore of the Sea of Galilee and walk a bit and just have some time together with us? Well, if it is chronological, then the other guys had not been called yet. They could have been among him. They could have been with him. But they hadn't been chosen and called. But let's just assume 
that we know only the things that we really know, and that is that he's already called how many people? You got, who's the first? John and Andrew, Peter and James, and who? Huh? Somebody say Levi? Yeah, Matthew. Matthew. So he's got, what's that? That's uh, five guys. They're with him. And we've seen, the amazing thing I always think about the, the Gospels, and you see this all the time, is the, what's the context, and then who's really there? Remember we talked about this last time? We said the Pharisees were there, the disciples of John the Baptist were there, um, and then there were honored guests of Levi was there, and who else do you think might be there? Those five, four guys, right? His disciples, they left everything and followed him, so here they are, they're with him in, the, in there. They're also in this story. They're with him in this story. And they became very aware very quickly that people were watching them. Yeah, I'm going to pick somebody out today, and today I'm just going to follow you everywhere you go. And I'm going to tell people that you're giving out $100 bills tomorrow. Everybody. Don't tell anybody. This person's giving out $100 bills tomorrow. So we got, and where do you think people would be? You go into your house, you sleep, where do you think they are? Outside your house, watching you. Hey, 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 everybody wake up. A light just came on in there. What are they doing? I think they're eating breakfast. What are they doing now? It looks like they're getting ready to get Look, Here they come. Let's go get them. And the throng. Just boom. Well, that was happening to his disciples as well. They were part of this group. And so Jesus and his disciples were under intense observation by the people to see where they would go and what he would talk about and what he would do and especially what he would do for them. Times they were near overtaken physically by this teeming crowd. We'll see in the future where at one point Jesus is trying to minister to people and his family, his mother who joined him there, she comes out with her, his, his sister and brother and brings him out. He just literally grabs him, brings him into the house because he was just being overwhelmed. They thought he was going to be exhausted. They said he looks like he was losing his mind. Well, if you say I'm going to minister to every single person in this place today and you know, you're at the Kennedy Center and it's filled, you know, somehow you're going to lose something. It's not your mind, your physical body. So they're seeing this. We observe this. They're seeing this. Second observation. If there was not enough, if this was not enough, excuse me, Jesus was under the scrutiny of the Pharisees and even the scrutiny of the disciples of John the Baptist. People were watching him in the case of John the Baptist, they were watching him to see if he was the one that John had talked about. We talked about that, how he demonstrated that. Remember how he, the words he said about the bridegroom? That the bridegroom, John the Baptist said, the bridegroom is coming. I'm just a friend of the bridegroom. When you see the bridegroom's voice, you'll know it's the Lamb of God. And so now Jesus identifies himself as the bridegroom. And that just sparked something in those disciples. We don't see that until far later, the, the reaction to that whole thing. But the Pharisees were there, and the Pharisees are there to watch him and see if he's going to do something. They already didn't like people that were, got crowds around them except themselves. They liked the, the idea of people telling them they were great, telling them they were good. And so they had this, this disciples of John the Baptist and the, and the Pharisees around them. And... We see that John the Baptist, this, I, I put down a note here in John chapter 3, verse 27 30. Some people say, well, I don't think there's a lot of evidence that the disciples of John the Baptist followed Jesus. Well, if they're listening to John, they did. To this John replied, a person can receive only what is given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. He must become greater and I must become less. You see this group of people that are kind of on the inside of things. Some of them on the inside of things for good and some of the inside of things for bad. Number three, third observation. In order for his message to be heard without being overrun by the crowds, Jesus changed his method for teaching his message. Where do you get that from? Well, 
he said to them, remember, verse 9, because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. It's a method. He did he have a boat there, be off the shore, or at the shore? He, no matter how many people were with him, he'd work himself right to the shore. He'd get in the boat. They pushed the boat back about 10 feet. So as a result, he could preach from the boat without anybody getting him. And then, of course, the disciples were staying in the boat with their paddles ready to hit anybody. No, just kidding. It was a method so he could be heard but not be touched. Do you think that that has any kind of a historical um, significance to what happens today? Well, imagine this being water right here, okay? Because here's the water, and you're out there on the shore, and I'm in a boat. The only difference is I'm not Jesus. That's praise the Lord. But um, the whole pulpit idea was something that was very likely established either during this time or for the methodology of keeping yourself aloof from crowds yet having a relationship with them. Now that's not something to get up and applaud about, but it's, it is an observation, isn't it? We see him other times perch himself on the top of a hillside or a mountain to gain some high elevation or position. And perhaps, perhaps, this might be the idea or the origin of modern pulpit preaching systems. Whitfield would do the same thing. He'd be in the crowd, he'd walk through the crowd, and he would come up onto the top of a platform. And he would only speak from the platform. In fact, sometimes I wonder if people even knew Whitfield was there until he stood up and started speaking. In order that this could take place. We're just to make some observations, right? See things here. And the fourth one, even in the midst of his tumultuous environment, Jesus continued to organize himself to have times of solitude, reflection, and prayer. He also organized himself so that his message could be heard, and he also organized himself so that he would stay on his mission. Very important to stay on your mission. Remember, I told you my mission was I just want to go sit in my office. Right? Uh, in Covey's book, uh, Seven Habits for Highly Successful People, I like the one where he says, um, he talks about one of the things that can cause you not to be effective is the ringing telephone. Excuse me. I got to take care of this. What is it? Somebody called me. Somebody. And so the ringing telephone becomes something that we respond to the ringing telephone, even though I said, what are you going to do today? Well, then I'm going to cut the grass, I'm going to do these three, four, five things, you know, or I'm going to go here or there or the other way. I'm going to, today I'm really going to focus on studying my Bible and read my Bible first. And it goes ding, ding, ding. You see it says, news, news break. Somebody just did something. You go, oh, and you pick up that telephone. What happened out there? What happened? You know, an hour and a half later, i got to get out of here, man. I'm going to be late for work. What happened to your plan? What happened to your plan? It gets disrupted for a ringing telephone or for something happening where you're trying to respond to the needs of people. If you try to live a life that responds to people and their needs and their wants and their desires and their plans, you will never accomplish anything yourself. Well, that's not very fair. That person's supposed to be doing that. Well, Jesus is supposed to be healing people. He's supposed to be doing things. But he's not supposed to lose focus for what his mission is. If he had listened to people, he would not have had a three-and-a-half-year ministry. He would have a 33-and-a-half-year ministry and still gaining when he decided to die on the cross. If he listened to people and their needs... If you let the circumstance around him determine the things he was doing, and where did he gain those insights? Of course, he gained it from his person. I'm not saying that Jesus stopped becoming Jesus, the incarnate one. Of course, he was that person. But you can see the way in which he was thronged by people. And as a result, we saw him tending things tending his time to say, I want to have a life of solitude. And we see it all throughout the book of Mark. 
Mark shows this more than any of the others because he shows Jesus to be Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. He shows this incarnate relationship. Instead of just coding it around with, you know, he's God, therefore he can do whatever he wants, and everything he does wants to be achieved, he sees that the humanity part being struggling with the humanity from the standpoint of being influenced and impacted by the humanity, and then the divine, of course, continuing to give this leadership and this protection and this servitude, as it says in Philippians, to the man, to the man of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. So we see the same thing, and we, and we see the same thing here. It's very instructive for us in verse 11. It says, Whenever the pure, in the pure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, What? You're the Son of God. Well, I just thought this was a man who could heal people. That's, that's how the Pharisees were looking at it, isn't it? They didn't look at Jesus as the Son of God. They didn't look at Him as having any divine characteristics. But those spirits, even the impure spirits, were giving a testimony to His true nature. He was the God-man. He was the incarnate one, the divine one. And as a result, we see the humanity that in, in, in His temptation. He, he has a suffering, this temptation, yet He overcomes it by the Word that dwelt with Him. We see this struggle with life. Even when you're doing something important, the struggle. And just look, you just look at persons. Just look just the, the presence of the United States. You see that, you know, you look at the presence of the United States when they first became president. And they do these flashbacks to the first speech they ever gave when they became president. And usually this young, you know, dark haired person, no wrinkles. Just, they look great. You give them about four years, and they go eight years, they look like old men. You seen it? Some of you don't look quite... No, just kidding. <laughs> I, just, I was looking at some old pictures today of this, uh, way back when this church was founded and then when, this church, when this building was being built and there was this young guy standing next to this pastor. I thought, who the heck is that guy? <laughs> you know, he was a lot skinnier. <laughs> no hair. <laughs> this thing right here. You know? <laughs> it was brown hair, right? It was brown hair. I mean, good grief. What made you that way? Well, often it's one thing to grow old with called gracefully, right? Something else to be driven to old age and are driven to exhaustion. And often the drive is because what we look at, we lose sight of our times of solitude, we lose, like, we lose a strategy for how you manage the situations of life, and finally, we pick up on other people's ideology, and we go from place to place to place to place. I had a pastor, a good friend of mine, young man. When I was young, he was young, and I didn't see him. I went to Bible college when I was taking some courses over um, uh, Valley Forge Bible College. That's not, that's not the name of it, but it was from Pennsylvania to do an extension course in Virginia. Took a couple courses. But anyway, we took these courses together, and then I, I came here, and I was in ministry here, and he was in Frederick, and, and uh, we didn't see each other a lot, but I just remember the, uh, the one time I, I, I just happened to run across, and we had a cup of coffee or something together, and he, he just looked like he, had, he looked like he was 30 years older than when I went to Bible college with him, just maybe five years before that, eight years before that. He looked weary. He looked, and so I said, "How's it going?" He said, "Because it was the height of the charismatic renewal. The charismatic renewal was: if you say Holy Spirit, you're gonna have a hundred people come to listen to what you have to say next." And then he made this statement to me. He said, "I said, well, what, how do you, how are you running things? What are you emphasizing? This kind of thing. That was that was the subject anyway." And he, this is what he said to me. He said, "Anything that has life in it." We're going to participate with it. That sounds pretty cool, right? Anything that has life in it, we're going to participate in it. And so they went through the falling down phenomena. They went through the baptism in the Holy Spirit phenomena. And, and I, I say that with grace, okay, because I know they're, I'm not trying to judge it. But they went through the gifts of the Spirit, prophesy and prophecy and speaking in tongues and then the falling down thing I say as I during the healing issue and then just 
just anything that came along. Then I wasn't surprised to find out the laughter thing that came out of um, Florida and also Toronto, the Toronto blessing. The whole laughter thing. They were right in the middle, ha <laughs> ha, you know, everything is great, a big laughter. The Holy Spirit renews the laughter. And then even the dog animals and the animal sounds and all, just all of these things that just kind of swept along through the church. It just kind of constantly swept the church, just swept along, see who's going to pick up, what's going to pick up. In, in this church, during a certain time, I remember the, basically the, the, the uh, purpose statement of the pastor was, we're going to catch on fire and people are going to come and watch us burn. Whew, what, what does that mean? Jesus, if you imagine, Jesus has built a fire, man, and people are coming to watch it burn, aren't, aren't they? But yet in the midst of this, he makes these very careful adjustments. Now, what I've said, it could even go to theological viewpoints and anything else we can think of. That, you know, I used to be that. I used to believe that way. You hear people say, I used to be think about that. I used to believe that. I used to believe that. I used to believe that. You think after a while, you believed everything. Jesus had a purpose that he was called to achieve. And he did not let himself be deterred. I love the passage where it says that Paul set his mind like flint to go to Jerusalem. Remember that text? And everybody around him saying, don't do it, you're going to get killed. Don't do it, you're going to get arrested. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. He said, I, if I have to go and die in Jerusalem, I will do it. How many of those kinds of convictions do we have in our lives? Things that we can't give up, we can't compromise on, because if we do, we'll lose our way. Pray that everybody on earth doesn't think you have all the answers. They all want to follow you. Jesus made this careful adjustment that we've seen him make again and again in the last portion here as we see but he gave them instructions or strict orders not to tell others about him you know i guess you could you could probably say that demons are the best example of a a bad relationship to have right Lord, help us if our enemies start broadcasting how great we are. Right? Help Paul, Lord, help Paul, when he and Barnabas were out together, when, when some person who was telling the future for the people who owned her, she was a slave, and she got wind of Paul and Barnabas, and she followed them around, and what'd she say? These are evil men. They watch these guys. Be careful. And she said, these are men of the most high God. These are men of the most high God falling around everywhere. Well, what's wrong with that? That's, that's great news, right? That's great advertisement. What did he do? He turned around and he rebuked this demon and commanded it to leave her. And suddenly she couldn't do anything she was doing before. She became real boring. The slave owners got mad. Paul got in trouble. Why would he even think to do that? Because he had a mission. His mission was not to himself be somebody, but for Jesus Christ to be somebody. For the word of God to be honored. For the word of God to be lifted up. For the mandates of God has to be lifted up. And Jesus here was promoting the mandates he'd been sent by God the Father to achieve. And that was not to grab every multitude, heal everybody, and be the Jesus is everybody's Jesus my Jesus did this for me. My Jesus did that for me. What is Jesus' mission? And then what are his methodologies to reach that? Do you want to be the pop most popular man that ever lived? Do you want to have people from high places on his side? Oh, we have senators. We have congressmen. We have NFL football players in our church. You hear that all the time. We have all these wonderful high people. Well, they got to go to church somewhere, right? But is that what a church is? It's the accumulation of as much and as many as we can possibly get? Or is it a place where the Word of God is honored, truth of God is honored, and the mission of Christ is honored? Lord, help us if we 
gain everything and lose the message of the cross. To be a place where a person cannot come and hear that Jesus Christ has come from heaven, the divine one, and he's lived a life in relationship to the very word of God in order that that man from Nazareth could be prepared to die a death on a cross with such a purity and an innocence that it would pay for the sins of you and me and all those for whom Christ died. All, the all, every single one. What if that wasn't a message you were hearing? Where do you go to church? You hear people, some people just, oh, yeah, I don't really go to church. You hear that. Well, I used to go to church. I tell some old story about how I used to go to church. And some people get to go to church. They're not really happy about the church. Some people go to church and they tell you they're really happy about their church. Why? You got the coolest band you ever saw, man. It's just like being in a concert, man. It's just like being really, it's, you know. Really? Okay. Tell me more about it. Oh, well, then, you know, sometimes you have guest, guest bands. They come in, too. And blah, 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 blah. You know, I, w- I was teamed with a guy for a while that, I mean, when I say team, we had a relationship, and they'd have national speakers come to their church for Sunday mornings, and because Sunday night, we had a Sunday night service, they'd come here on Sunday nights. And so we just be say just filled with people because so and so was here, some nationally known speaker was here. You know, David Wilkerson's brother spoke in this church. He spoke down there first. I don't want to name the names. I can't remember the names. They had all these persons that were just—they drew this huge crowd. And they were gone. You say, "Well, we've had so and so at our church. We've had so and so at our church. We did this at our church." Yeah. We studied through the book of Revelation first by first for two and a half years. Want to come through on us? Do the Gospel of John only two years. Want to join us? Doing the Gospel of Mark. He's only been preached. This is like his 12th, 13th sermon. Where is he? Third chapter. Want to join us? So is that enticing? I hope so. Jesus would not follow even those who were basically coming out, these impure spirits, and recognize immediately that no man can do this, that God is the one who delivers and has power over spirits, all spirits. Jesus preaching this new covenant context, this new covenant message. We see him over and over again. He tries to keep himself away from people, try not to let them make him the king As we said before, Jesus wasn't looking for the purpose and the mission in response to people's needs. He's acting, not reacting. It's viewed in his earlier reaction to the crowds as he separates himself from the throng in order to focus upon the mission through solitude. Finally, he continues to rebuke the impure spirits and command them not to speak because he doesn't want to entice people to believe that that's his mission. He didn't come to Cast out all devils, he came to defeat the kingdom of darkness and to deliver us into the kingdom of light. Do you believe that? Does that resonate in your soul? His true identity as a son of God in order to distance himself from those who would make him king but not Lord, those who would divert him from his mission on to one that would lead to a destruction of souls. What a text. What a text. Thank you, Father. We humble ourselves before your word and before you today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.